Tyler. Hello. Thank you so much for being here. Hey, thank you. Very excited uh, to be sharing a program with you. I'm thrilled that we're both doing Barber and presenting this this evening of all Barber all the time. Um, <laughs> looking forward to chatting a little bit about it. Yeah, what a pleasure. Thanks, Elizabeth. All right. Uh, I'm firstly, if you'd love to talk a little bit about your piece, um, you're welcome to, to chat about Barber or uh, the work specifically or, or really anything you'd like. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think uh, the American composer Samuel Barber is um, pretty known <laughs> among, among folks who listen to, uh, you know, 20th century uh, classical music for sure. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about this piece in particular. Um, so the piece I've performed for this festival is called Knoxville Summer of 1915. And in spite of the name, uh, it was not composed in 1915. <laughs> um, the piece was written in 1947 and uh, originally composed for uh, an American soprano who commissioned it and uh, for orchestra, but the composer um, Samuel Barber also wrote the piano version, which is what folks are gonna be hearing today. Um, so first things first, um, this is not a song cycle. <laughs> which I just want to be transparent about um, in the sense that it's not a collection of pieces, it's just one continuous piece. And the text that it sets, which was written by James Agee, is also a continuous piece um, rather than a collection of texts. But I think we could fairly say that it has some things in common with a song cycle um, in that uh, it's very, so the, the, excuse me, the composition is very responsive to the text. It engages very deeply with the text. Um, so, I mean, I think it has a lot to do with Barber's other writing, which I'm sure you can speak to anon. Um, but uh, certainly like a song cycle, it is um, an extended enga musical engagement with a written text. Um, and that written text actually predated the piece. James A.G. wrote the text in 1938. And um, so both that text and the musical response to it um, have a lot to do with sort of engagement with American life and with the experiences of these individuals. But um, particularly, uh, A.G.'s text reflects on a time in his life just prior to the loss of his father. So when he speaks about 1915, um, he is talking about, as uh, he says, that time during which I was so successfully disguised to myself as a child. Um, he is reflecting on his young life, um, but the very next year after 1916, rather, um, his father uh, passed away suddenly and his life changed a great deal. And Samuel Barber, when he encountered this text and chose to write a uh, piece of music setting it, um, was also in the process of his father's decline. So it seems like something both of them really um, focused on and responded to creatively, um, and something very hard that I is sort of like the, um, the, the piece of grit that <laughs> causes the pearl to form, um, something difficult out of which came these really beautiful musical and artistic results. I think that is more than I had intended to say, so perhaps it will be shorter <laughs> one day. Oh, thank you, Tyler. I, you know, I know the piece really well, and I didn't know that about about Barber's sort of personal connection to that experience. So thank you for for sharing. That's, uh, yeah, that's sad and lovely. Um, yeah, I agree. <laughs> Uh, something, I, I also appreciate your mentioning that yours is in fact not a song cycle. What's uh, extra hilarious is that it was actually your interest in performing this piece that led rock opera to creating a song cycle festival. Um, so again, weird. I think we all are in agreement that like, sure, sure, not technically a cycle. But, you know, we all, we have, I think a lot of us have these wonderful pieces in our repertoire that are these shorter works. Um, mm that are just sort of challenging to program because they're long enough uh, yeah. that you're not gonna just slap them on to sort of a, a normal concert, you know, whatever yeah. that means. Uh, and, <laughs> and they're short enough that it's pretty challenging to get, to bring a full orchestra together and, and to program Absolutely. something that's, that's this sort of odd length. Um, so thank you for inspiring this project. Oh gosh, well, thank you for the opportunity. And I think like you, I've known the piece for 
a long time. I haven't had a prior opportunity to perform it. And um, I'm so grateful to be able to do it now under such odd circumstances. Very strange, very strange circumstances. <laughs> Well, and then one of the things um, that was was really important for rock opera when we were programming this this festival was that we uh, we really wanted to use music that you know that tied into the sort of current life that we're all living in in some way, whether it's because the piece was recently written or it's because of sort of its thematic content. Um, you know, we wanted to present a concert that certainly people who already love this music would resonate with, but also that anyone could sort of swing by and, and really find things to hook into. Um, so I wanted to ask you a little bit about what it is about your piece that really feels uh, of the times. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, you know, as, as you acknowledge, I had a prior interest in performing this piece in general. And so um, I was really, uh, appreciative of the question that rock opera posed um, and kind of uh, appreciated the opportunity to push myself to engage further with what, what felt so meaningful about the work. And, um, you know, so I think in spite of the fact that certain aspects of the piece um, speak to a much earlier um, iteration of American life, and I think um, you know, some of the text talks about a streetcar going by and it's like this sort of intrusion of modernity in this bucolic world of the piece. And, um, and that's very funny from a, from a contemporary perspective that uh, a streetcar clanging along would feel so um, urban and <laughs> disruptive. But, um, you know, as I spent time with this piece um, recently, um, I think some of the thematic content feels incredibly apt to certainly my experience of um, of the COVID-19 pandemic and of uh, life in sort of 2020 and 2021. And um, some of the, the kind of focus areas that felt so germane to me were um, the way that the piece and the text sort of dwell lovingly on experiences in the natural world. Um, so much of the piece really enlivens um, experiences of the night sky and the feeling of the air and being outdoors has taken on this tremendous significance, I think, um, certainly in my life and for many of us. And uh, for me, that has been um, kind of a dramatic uh, and unexpected turn. I thought of myself as being uh, someone who uh, is so much more oriented towards kind of urban cultural experiences and um, so it has been, it has felt very personal to be singing about experiences in the natural world with such appreciation and admiration um, and love. So that felt very pertinent. Um, the piece also really focuses on um, life in family and with beloved family members. And, you know, I think um, certainly many of us as our worlds have gotten smaller for the, for safety reasons, um, have felt very um, strongly about our native or chosen families, that, um, that our feeling of being secure within the family and wanting to be secure within the family has taken on so much weight. Um, and I know for many of us that, that weight comes from um, a loss of access to our family, whether because we can't see them so that we know that they're safe at home, or whether we're genuinely losing family members. Um, uh, so the last thing about the piece that I think feels really emotionally resonant um, is its incredible and heartbreaking uncertainty, um, <laughs> which um, I think has always really resonated with me um, when I was a very young Tyler and I was singing the piece to get to know this. Um, I, I couldn't get through the end of it without crying because of its incredible, powerful statement of uncertainty. And some of that uncertainty comes from a fear of loss that, you know, this precious time in nature and this precious time with our loved ones could be lost. Um, and so the piece ends um, with this incredible longing to, to know one's place in the world, to feel sure about who we are and who we're meant to be. Um, that has felt incredibly um, powerful in, in recent times. I think as many of us are grappling with so many kinds of loss and so many fears. Um, 
there's something extraordinary about being able to place that fear and that longing for certainty within such a beautiful context. Um, so uh, the last thing I guess I want to say about how we tried to how I tried to engage that those relevant points, not just inside myself, but also in the presentation of the piece um, was, so I, there's a visual component, there's a visual thread that runs through the text, and that is this sort of um, movement from evening into night. That takes place over the course of sort of 17 minutes that the piece is happening. Uh, it is evening, um, you know that from the very first moments of the text, and the evening slips away into night, and then the speaker eventually is brought in to go to sleep. Um, uh, that also felt like something that I could um, experience in real time in my own life and share. Um, so in the visual narrative that we created for this piece, um, there are images of uh, sunset and nightfall you know, that come from lots of days when I was looking out my window or rare occasions when I could be outside, but also from other people in my life who contributed their own views of night slipping, uh, day slipping away into night um, from their own perspectives. So the hope was that that felt relatable um, and uh, like something we could share kind of in, in sharing the piece, also share the experience of watching evening turn into night. Yeah, that's a lovely, that's a lovely thing to add in is that we're all <laughs> having this shared experience in a lot of ways. Uh, oh, that's wonderful. Um, well, and, and certainly, you know, the, we, we asked you and, and we asked our singers to not only record a piece, but to create a video, which may have been something that some other singers have done before, was certainly uh, not something I'd ever done. Um, and I, I'd love to hear sort of how this experience was for you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we're all um, coping with uh, with modes of performance and sharing our work that we hadn't explored before. And um, so, I mean, certainly getting to do so at all is a pleasure and a privilege. And, um, but I think also, you know, one of the reasons um, why we needed to think really creatively about the visual representation is we've all been kind of in this pandemic world um, and in this internet world for a while now. And are, I think, kind of painfully aware of how different it feels to watch a performance, you know, outside of the kind of performance space and outside of real time. And um, so there's an opportunity, but also a real need to make that feel engaging and, and meaningful. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, there were aspects of preparing and creating this performance that were normal, so to speak, um, you know, uh, lots of time digging into my personal practice and um, kind of engaging with how I could present this piece and, and getting into my body. But then also um, a lot of time kind of meditating on what I could represent visually that would be something other than me standing or singing at you. Um, so it was important to me that we see some of the kind of collaboration in the piece. So you'll see some visual elements of um, my wonderful collaborator, Nathan Chung, uh, playing piano because um, there's a lot of sound in this piece that's not me singing <laughs> and uh, certainly it was great to be able to um, bring that into the, the visual representation but um, you know I think it was also an exercise in really exploring how the world of the piece could exist visually beyond um, just in a kind of strict verbatim here is a singer singing, here's a piano playing. So um, it was important to me that the visual representation be a little bit broader and not overly literal, um, especially since I feel this, that this piece has um, real emotional resonance. I didn't um, want to be too literal in how we visually represented it um, and feel kind of tied to uh, it, trying to somehow recreate summer in Knoxville in 1915 when it was winter in Rochester in 2020, 2021. So, um, yeah, I think it was a challenge, certainly. Um, I was really fortunate in having 
not only a wonderful musical collaborator, but also a collaborator who was working with me to create the, the video aspect of this. Um, so huge appreciation to Adam for being uh, a willing and capable collaborator. But um, yeah, I think it's something that we really don't think about when we're preparing a live performance. And so I'm grateful for the opportunity to explore uh, a visual narrative, but um, certainly also miss <laughs> aspects of kind of live collaboration and live performance that are just out of reach for now. Thank you. Well, Thank just you. the other day we were talking about, oh, hey, maybe next year for a, the Song Cycle Festival that, of course, we'll be doing again, we'll just do this exact same programming, but live. Piece, <laughs> 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 we'll call it. Um, yeah. Yeah, Gosh. I, I think that's true that, right, that it's it's so wonderful to get to, uh, to get to experiment and to get to really um, engage in creative thinking and also, you know, <laughs> we're all continuing to feel uh, the loss of, of what we can't, of what we can't access at the moment. Um, and I think that that probably plays a, a large role in, in all of our pieces. I think that mm -hmm. all, that sort of feeling uh, will carry through. Well, thanks again. I'm, I'm so excited to watch it and I will see you on the other side. Great, thank you.